this image and likeness, that doesn't mean the shape of your body. It doesn't mean your maleness or femaleness, because God doesn't have a body. No, if God is love, and God has created us in His image and likeness, that means our true identity, who we really are, is love. That is what our purpose in life is, to be who God made us to be, to be love. That is why we are here. And that is what sustains us. You know, the scriptures tell us that in God we live and move and have our being. If God is love, then we can change that phrase to say, in love we live and move and have our being. Love is what keeps us alive. Without love, we die. And I don't mean that as just kind of a, a romantic thing to say. We actually know it's true because in the Second World War, the Nazis conducted an experiment. I think you know that they were trying to develop a, a race of supermen who would be soldiers who would be absolutely devoid of compassion, totally ruthless, and totally would follow orders without question. And they thought that what made soldiers soft was these romantic notions that all of us grow up with about love. So the way they conducted their experiment was in one of their concentration camps. They got these newly born Jewish babies and they divided them into three groups. They put them in three separate rooms. The babies in the first room, basically their mothers were admitted in there. The mothers were allowed to feed the babies, clean them, change them, show them affection, do everything that a mother would do for its child. The babies in the second room were only looked after by German nurses. The German nurses were under instructions to feed the babies, clean them, change them, but show them no affection. The babies in the third room were all fed, cleaned, changed by mechanical devices. There was no human contact. After three months of the experiment, the babies in the first room, as you can imagine, thrived. They were normal, happy, healthy babies. The babies in the second room where the German nurses went in, who certainly fed them, cleaned them, changed them, but showed them no affection, all were showing signs of emotional and psychological disturbance. In other words, they were crying inconsolably, banging their heads against the side of the bed. Already there were signs of psychological damage. The babies in the third room that were all fed, cleaned, and changed by mechanical devices to no human contact, all died. Without love, we cannot survive, because if our essence is love, if that is who we are, then love is what keeps us alive. Now, all of you here are actually alive because all of you here have received love. But all of us here also are a bit broken. And the reason is that we have all been born into the human condition. And in this world, in this life, we experience two kinds of love. We experience conditional love and we experience unconditional love. Conditional love is the kind of love that says, I love you because you're pretty. I love you because you've got money. I love you because you're meeting my needs and my expectations, but the moment you stop, if you change, I won't love you anymore. I love you if you get good grades. I love you if you keep your room tidy. I love you if you make your bed in the morning. I love you if you're a good boy. I love you if you're a good girl. I love you until I find someone better. See, that is love. That's a business deal. And a person who is only ever loved in that way in the end doesn't feel loved, they feel used. You don't love me. You love my looks, you love my money, you love the fact that I'm meeting your expectations, but you don't love me. No, the only kind of love that's worth anything, the only kind of love that helps a person believe enough in themselves to be their true self, 
to be who they have it within them to be. The only kind of love that in actual fact is love, is unconditional love. That's the kind of love that says, I don't love you because you're pretty. I don't love you because you got money. I don't love you because you're meeting my needs. I mean, don't get me wrong. Those things are nice. But I love you for you. And I am committed to loving you. Even if you throw my love back in my face, I will still love you. And there is nothing you can do that can change that. You see, if God is love, the only kind of God love that God can be is unconditional love because there is no other. And this is where our problem lies with sharing God's love because traditionally as Catholics, the God that we were taught about, the God that we were presented with was a God of conditional love. When you look at the Bible, particularly if you look at the Old Testament, the God we're presented with is a God of conditional love. A God who says, if you are good, I will reward you. And if you are bad, I'm going to punish you. And that is where our confusion lies in terms of what love really is. Because if that is the kind of love that we get from God who is love, then that's the kind of love we give to each other. It's like, to use an analogy to give you a sense of the God we were brought up with, let's use the analogy of an extended family. And let's say that God is a member of your extended family. Let's call him Uncle George. Now, when you were little, your parents told you about Uncle George, how wonderful he is and how powerful, but how interested he is in every individual. And finally the day comes when your parents are going to take you to meet Uncle George. When you arrive, you discover that Uncle George lives in a rather formidable mansion. And when you meet Uncle George, he's tall, with a big beard, a little bit austere and harsh looking, and after you've been there for a while, you just can't figure out what your parents see in Uncle George. I mean, you can't figure out why he, for them, he is such a jewel in the family crown. And finally, when you get to the end of your visit and you're about to go home, Uncle George addresses you directly. And Uncle George says to you, my dear, from now on, I want you to come and visit me once a week. And if you don't, well, let me show you what will happen. And with that, Uncle George takes you from your parents and takes you down to the basement of his mansion. And as you're going down the stairs, it's getting hotter and it's getting darker. And finally, you find yourself in this dark and stuffy basement. And in front of you are these great big steel doors. And Uncle George opens one of those steel doors and says to you, my dear, look inside. And what meets your eyes is a scene of utter horror. These furnaces that are blazing and demons throwing men, women, and children into the furnaces because they did not visit Uncle George once a week and because they didn't live up to Uncle George's expectations. And then Uncle George takes you back up and gives you back to your parents and says to you, see you next week. And as you walk back with your parents to your car, clutching their hands all the tighter, your mom leans down to you and says, don't you just love Uncle George with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength? And you say, yes, absolutely. Because to contemplate anything else is to end up in that horror that you saw down in that basement. And that begins your life of religious schizophrenia. Where on the one hand, you outwardly claim that you love Uncle George. But deep down in a place that you won't admit to anyone, maybe not even to yourself, you loathe Uncle George for the monster 
that he is. See, that is the early formation that many of us as Catholics got. And it is very hard then, later on in life, since Vatican II, when we've promoted God's love, it's hard to truly embrace that because deep down inside, we're afraid that when we die, we might meet Uncle George instead. So this then becomes a problem. How can we love? How can we emulate God's love when that is the picture of God that we were brought up with? Of course, the thing is that when you look at the New Testament, we find another picture presented for us. The picture that Jesus presents is captured in stories like the prodigal son. Now, I'm sure all of you know the prodigal son so well, you could probably recite it off by heart. And that's the problem. You know, when I say Mass, and that's the Gospel, and I get up on the lectern and I read that Gospel, I look out at the congregation, and there's this look that goes over people's faces. And I think it's something like this. Oh, I know this one. And then they switch off. So what I thought I'd do, to be able maybe to give you a sense of how Jesus' audience would have heard that parable the first time, is I'm going to tell it to you again, but I'm going to modernize it a bit, and I'm going to dramatize it a bit. Okay, the story is that the Pharisees came along with a question in their heart to Jesus, and that question was, what does God think of a sinner? In all their glorified self-righteousness, what does God think of a sinner? And so Jesus says, well, once upon a time, there was this man who had two sons, and they lived in a sheep property out on the Darling Downs near Toowoomba. And one day, the younger son comes up to his father, he says, Dad, I've had it with the dust and the flies. I've had it with the mud, the sheep, the cold, the heat. You just don't know how to live. And I do. So what I want you to do is to sell off half your property and show me the money. I mean, you would have done it when you died anyway. Okay, I can look after myself. I don't need you anymore. And the father says, well, look, son, I'm not getting any younger. The arthritis in my hands is getting pretty bad and I can really use the help on the property. But the kid says, oh, no, no, dad, don't give me any sermons. Just give me my money and I'll be on my way. So the father sells off half the property and gives his son the money. And his son goes off, doesn't look back. But every evening the father stands at the doorway of the house and he looks down the dirt track that leads to the property and he hopes and he waits and he prays for the dead that his boy will come home. Meanwhile, his son has moved down here to Brisbane. He's got himself a nice little apartment unit overlooking the casino. And he's really living the high life. I mean, wine, women, and song. He's going to all the best parties in Brisbane and mixing with all the beautiful people. And he's picked up a couple of new habits that he didn't have before. And because he's such a high roller on the blackjack table and the roulette wheel, it doesn't take too long before he runs out of money. And at the same time, he kind of runs out of friends. So he goes to the people that he used to party with and he says, hey, I need a job. But no one's going to give him anything. And now he begins to get desperate because he's going to have to find some money to pay this new habit that he's got. And one day, one of the people he used to party with says to him, you want a job? I got a job for you. Good looking young fellow like you. Ah, there's money to be made on the streets of Brisbane. Oh yeah, a good-looking young fellow like you, you could pull big bucks on the streets of Brisbane. And so he begins life as a male prostitute. And he experiences the humiliation, the degradation, and the dehumanization that that lifestyle is all about. And the thing is, of course, with the money that he makes, he still has to pay his pimp off. And sometimes on his way home from work, some hoods drive past in the car and say, look, there's a homosexual. And they beat him up and they take the money that he's got. So sometimes he doesn't even have enough money to put food on the table. He begins to lose weight. 
he begins to get sick. And one day he wakes up to himself and he thinks to himself, you know, the shearers on my father's property, the hired men, they had it better than this. I mean, at least they were earning a decent wage so they could put a decent feed on the table, and here I am starving to death. So he makes up his mind and he thinks, I'm going to go home. And I'm going to say to my father, look, Dad, I know I let you down. I don't expect you to take me back as your son. But would you just give me a job? Would you just take me on as one of your hired men? You know I can do the work. And so he makes up his mind and off he goes. Now while he's still a long way off, his father sees this lone figure walking down the dirt track. And he recognizes the walk, you know, the swing of the arms? All the signs that love recognizes that this is his boy coming home. And he runs out to his son and he throws his arms around his son and he says, you're back, it's all I wanted. And the son tries to get out this rehearsed act of contrition. But the father doesn't give him a chance to finish. He calls one of the workmen over and says, hey look, Go inside my bedroom. On the bedside table, you'll find my car keys. Bring them over. Give it to my son. In the first drawer, you'll find my wallet. Inside, you'll find my visa card. Take it. Bring it over. Give it to my son. <coughs> that calf we've been fattening for the Eka, kill it. Barbecue it. Call all the neighbors around. We're going to have a party. You can go parties because my boy has come home. So they're in their party. Meanwhile, the other son, the one who stuck around with the sheep, he comes in from working with the sheep and he sees this party going on. So he calls one of the hired men and he says, hey, what's going on? He said, oh, the king came home tonight. Did you meet my brother? He says, yeah, yeah, your dad's still in my party. He says, you go in there and you tell my father, I'm not going to put a foot in that house till that kid leaves. You go in there and tell him that. So the father comes out and says, Son, what is it? What is it? You must be kidding. Look at this face. Look at the calluses on my hands. I'm the one that stayed here. He left you. Didn't even look back and now he comes home. Gonna mooch off you. What do you do? You don't even ever ask him where he's been or what he's done. You throw him a party. You've never thrown a party for me. And the father says, Son, I didn't know you wanted a party. If you want a party for you and your friends, it's yours. Everything I have is yours. But just try to understand how a father feels when he thinks his son is dead and he finds out that he's alive. When he thinks his son is sick and he finds out that he's well. When he thinks his son is lost and he finds out that he's okay. So the Pharisees were asking Jesus in all their glorified self-righteousness, what does God think of a sinner? And Jesus was saying back to them, do you have any idea how much God loves you as his son, as his daughter? How God feels when you wander away from him? How God feels when you come home? That is what God thinks of a sinner. That is what unconditional love looks like. The father doesn't stand there and says, well, what have you been doing? With who, what, where, when, how? Accepts him without question. Throws a party to celebrate his return. Jesus also said, no greater love can a person have than if he lays down his life for his friends. Then he went ahead and did just that to show us what it means to say that God is love. So this is the thing. If we have been created in the image and likeness of God, that is our true nature. When we love, we are being our true self. We are being our best self. Our purpose in life is to love. We fulfill our mission in life when we love. So what is it that stops us from being our true self? What is it that stops us from loving? Well, it's like I said, we have been born into the human condition. It is an experience of conditional love. Or another way of putting that, 
is it is an experience of limitations. Limits in terms of how much we're loved. Limits in terms of how much we're respected. Limits in terms of how much we cherish. Limits in terms of how much we are valued. See, the closest we come in this world to unconditional love is the love that we get from our mothers. Because in most families, the mother is the primary caregiver. In some families, she is the only caregiver. And because our mothers are human, because they themselves too have experienced conditional love and therefore are broken, they also sometimes give us conditional love. They also sometimes say to us things that, I will love you if you're a good boy. I will love you if you're a good girl. If you don't do what I want, you're going to get punished. And so we perceive that as love with strings attached. And like I said, when we only get conditional love, we become damaged. When you live in a household which is dysfunctional, when you grow up in a household which is abusive, the damage is so much greater. You cannot give to others what you haven't got to yourself. That damage makes a profound impact on us. It is very hard to love when we ourselves haven't received all the love we need. See, that part of us, the sad thing is that when you're a baby, a baby thinks that the world out there is an extension of itself. A baby, in as much as it can think, perceives the world as existing to meet its needs. When a baby needs, when it is hungry, thirsty, when it is uncomfortable, it expresses its need in the most raw fashion of all. It cries. And usually, mum comes along and feeds it, cleans it, changes it, and so on. But the thing is that as time goes on, we realize that sometimes we cry and mum is delayed. Or sometimes we cry and mum comes along and can't work out why we're crying. Or sometimes we cry and mum is having a bad day herself and she becomes a little bit rough with us. And all those things make us realize that the world out there is not an extension of us. The world out there is separate to us. And we begin to form what's called our ego boundary. The wall behind which this is me and outside of which that is you. We discover that that world sometimes is not going to rush to try to meet our needs. When we grow up a little bit more and we start to mix with our siblings, we discover we have to compete for mom and dad's love, for mom and dad's attention. We start to learn that the world is a place we have to fight to get what we want. When we go to school, we find more than enough people who are more than happy to laugh at us, make fun of us, bully us, hurt us. All those things hurt. When we get hurt like that, what happens is we fall back on our instinct for survival. Trust if you like, is the runt of our emotional litter. Under harsh conditions, it is the first thing to die. So when our trust is broken, when we discover that the world out there doesn't have our best interest at hand and is going to hurt us, we stop trusting it. We stop trusting people. And what happens then is that we ultimately collude with that world out there because we're trying to work out why have I been hurt? What has happened that this world outside is hurt? We don't want to be hurt. Our instinct for self-preservation makes us want to survive. And so we employ our brain to try to work out why has this happened to me? Why haven't I been loved the way I need to be loved? Why have I been hurt? And tragically, the conclusion we come to is it's because there must be something wrong with me. I'm not lovable. I'm not perfect. 
I'm ugly. I'm not good. And so we then collude with that world out there and we say to ourselves, I don't like you either. You stay inside there and you don't come out. Because when you come out, we become vulnerable. People see us and then they can hurt us. But remember I told you that story about the German baby experiment? We need love to survive. If we're not going to get it, we're not even going to get it from ourselves. What happens is we start to try to steal it from others. Attention-seeking behavior comes from that brokenness. We're trying to get the love that we need by attracting people's attention. If we become so bitter by life that we think no one's going to give me what I need, then we resort to taking what we need. Stealing, manipulating others, all of that comes from that brokenness because we don't believe people are going to give us what we need, therefore we've got to take it. When we fall in love, okay, the experience of falling in love is not real love. The experience of falling in love comes from that place of brokenness. We think, when we fall in love, it's like we think we've finally found the person who is going to make us better. We've finally found the person who's going to heal that brokenness, who's going to give us all the love and attention that we've been craving all our lives. We finally found the person who's going to make us feel special, who's going to value us, who's going to give us all the love that we need. And we get married. And then, six, seven years down the track, we realize to our horror, you're not the person I married. Of course they're not. Because you didn't fall in love with the real person. You fell in love with an idea of who you wanted that person to be for you. You weren't thinking of them, you were thinking of yourself. And of course, when the illusion is shattered and you realize this person can't meet my needs because they also are broken and are looking for me to meet their needs, that's when a lot of marriages break up. The average lifespan for a marriage that ends in divorce is seven years. That's why it's true what they call the seven-year itch. Okay, it means that after that period of time, the gloss is worn off. And that's because falling in love is not real love. If you like, falling in love, to use a cynical way of looking at it, is nature's way of fooling us long enough to procreate the species before we discover what a terrible mistake we've made. <laughs> but falling in love does serve a purpose. Falling in love keeps us together long enough so that maybe real love can take its place. Falling in love means that we are prepared to overlook our partner's habits, annoying actions and behaviors until real love can take its place. So real love is not falling in love. You see, a lot of people today think that love is a feeling. Love isn't a feeling. I mean, if all love was was a feeling, then the first time you get angry with your partner, your feelings have changed to anger. And therefore, you don't love them anymore. But you know it doesn't work that way. You know you can be angry at someone and still love them. And that's because love is much more than a feeling. Love is a commitment. But it is a very particular kind of commitment. You see, some people think when I tell them about conditional and unconditional love, and that unconditional love is the only real love, they think that that means that it's a commitment that means that no matter what this other person does to me, if they beat me, if they abuse me, I'm still going to stick with the marriage. That's not love. That's stupidity. <laughs> You see, love is a very particular kind of commitment. It is a commitment to the other person's growth. It means you are committed to do everything in your power to help this person grow into the person they have it within them to be. To put up with abuse, to put up with beatings, 
is not going to help the other person to grow. All that's going to do is tell them they can get away with that. It's like a child that throws a tantrum. If you give the child what it wants, the only thing the child's going to learn is, ah, if I throw a tantrum, they're going to give me what I want. The child doesn't grow up. If you really love the child, you will say, look, I know you don't understand, but I cannot give you this because I love you. I know you want this, but I know it's not good for you to have it. And that's why I can't give it to you. I haven't abandoned you. It's not that I don't love you. I'm still here. But it's because I love you that I cannot give this to you. That's when the child learns that it can manipulate. That's when a child learns that that's not who their true self is. Their true self is love. Love is a commitment to the other person's growth. That means sometimes you've got to leave your partner the space to make their own mistakes. Because you don't grow up unless you learn from your mistakes. If you are the type of parent that is so protective of your child, you won't let them make any mistakes or get hurt. The child remains a child. They can never grow up because they've never learned to stand on their own two feet. Love is about being there when that person falls so that you can give them the encouragement to get up again. That is what real love does. Love is what we were made for. Love is our destiny. Thank you.